Uh, I'm glad everybody got an opportunity to take, take their pictures and uh, have some appetizers and drinks and hors d'oeuvres. <clears throat> uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. And uh, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Dr. Larry Kawa. I appreciate that you, uh, you joined us here today. And uh, as most of you probably know, I am a conservative Republican, as most of you are conservative Republicans. <laughs> no red team. Even my hair is red. <laughs> and uh, I was actually going to say, it's not that, that I, I hate liberal Democrats, I don't, I'm not against anything, I don't hate anybody, I just have a totally different perspective than them, probably you guys share in that same philosophy. And uh, in, in coming here today, I actually realized there's one thing that I could say conservatives and liberals probably do agree upon, <clears throat> and that's that liberals really know how to party better than we do, because I was looking back two weeks ago, and I said, you know, that party they had for the GSA, the General Services Administration, for almost a million dollars. I mean, that was just fabulous. I don't know how they did that. I mean, they had clowns, bubble baths, and champagne. That was just, that was off the charts. And I'm sure other services, which really weren't described. Although I do understand that under Obama's watch, 11 Secret Service agents did take advantage of those other services at a brothel in Cartagena, Columbia. And the only reason they got busted for that was because they didn't want to pay when they left. So I guess they thought it was just another entitlement. <laughs> yeah, but think of all the prostitutes out of a job. Now, in terms of having get-togethers, you guys just have me. Sorry. No brothel, no, no bubble bath, no champagne, no clowns. So, uh, but with that being said, having had the opportunity to speak to many of you on the phone, uh, one point that, that came across is a lot of you said that uh, you weren't involved in politics, <clears throat> and uh, I appreciate the opportunity for allowing you to, 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 to allow me to help you get involved in politics. But my response, as you know, has been, it's like a drowning man saying he's not involved in the water, it surrounds you. Politics is involved in you, it just hopes that you're not interested because it likes to take your money while you sleep. And uh, like most of us, I'm a fiscal conservative. And, uh, and it bothers me in terms of what I see. But I have some interesting numbers facts, if you guys don't mind stretching out, do some mental acrobatics. Uh, and these are not figures that are, that are skewed. They, they come from the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, which is a, a nonpartisan division of government, is my understanding. And they say that the, the top 10% of our uh, income earners, which most of you are in, by the way, whether you know it or not, I know you don't consider yourselves to be the uber rich, but I will say that physicians, dentists, and attorneys typically or within that 10%. <clears throat> the top 10% bracket uh, accounts for 70% of the federal income tax. The top 1% accounts for 40% of the federal income tax. The lowest 50% of income earners accounts for only about 1% of the federal income tax. So picture this. If you're in the top 10%, which you probably are, if you go to dinner with nine other people, and you go to a nice dinner and the bill comes out and it's $500, you chip in $350, and everybody else puts in, the other nine people each put in $15, and they say that you didn't pay your fair share, yeah. and when can we go again? <clears throat> so that's the circumstance that you're in as a top 10 percenter. Now, the top 1 percent of the United States population has an aggregate net wealth of $1.5 trillion. The lowest 50 percent of income earners have an aggregate net wealth of that same amount, $1.5 trillion. But there's a difference. The top 1% who pay 40% of the federal income tax <clears throat> pay 2,000 times the percentage rate of income tax as the average person in that, that bottom 50% bracket. Because if you think about it, anyone in that bracket pays 150th of 1% of the federal income tax. But they would like to tell you that they deserve more money and they need more help in the interest of compassion, rather than compassion being defined as you being able to keep the money that you've actually earned. And they would like to tell you how to spend your money, even though you are building their bro roads, their bridges, their tunnels, the army that defends them, their schools, uh, their post offices. Uh, they still want to tell you that in addition to having welfare and Medicaid and unemployment for 99 weeks right now, that now they would also like you to pay for their health care. <clears throat> Unemployment is at 99 weeks, which is a record high. Uh, two year, it's almost two years, obviously. And if somebody told you that you didn't have to work for two years, you probably wouldn't be all that anxious to go out and say, well, you know what, I want to go get a job. But uh, <clears throat> as a result of that, uh, 
the, the, ad, the aggregate net wealth of the United States has diminished in these last three years. Three years ago, the United States of America was worth $68 trillion. We've been in, in a, a rapid downward spiral of 19% over three years. We are now worth $55 trillion. <clears throat> and uh, getting back to the, the unemployment issue, uh, the unemployment insurance, I should say, it was never meant to be a hammock. It was meant to be a trampoline. It's a safety net. But when somebody doesn't get, you know, you have two years of being able to, to go without work and still get paid, it's very unfortunate, but in essence, what you're doing is you're enabling somebody to not work. And there seems to be more and more <laughs> of, of that occurring. You know, since I mentioned trillions of dollars, <clears throat> uh, you know, Ronald Reagan, when he was the president, when he first sp spoke in front of the joint sessions of Congress, he realized that they couldn't get their mental arms around what a trillion dollars is. So I'm going to try to give you the best example that I could come up with, which is the one that he gave. <clears throat> If you could take $1,000 bills, which actually do exist as, as currency between the banks, Grover Cleveland is, is on the bill, and you could stack it, those $1,000 bills the thin way with the rubber band around them, how high would it be? Just ask yourself this question, to be a million dollars. And the answer is four inches. Now, in order to turn that into a trillion dollars, why don't you ask yourself <clears throat> how high that stack of bills would be, just in your own mind. If you said 63.3 miles, you'd be correct because that's how far it is to have a trillion dollars, a thousand dollar bill stacked the thin way. Being that we are now about 15 trillion dollars in debt, that means that you could stack thousand dollar bills the thin way from the tip of Key West halfway to Canada in order to pay off the American debt. And I think that this president has forgotten the rule of holes. When you're in one, stop digging. <clears throat> we are spending more and more of, of your money and uh, we can't spend our way to prosperity no matter how hard we try. And I think if, if you were to ask yourself, if you didn't have much money left, would you think a good solution is to take what little you have left and spend that and borrow from friends forcibly and spend that as well? Because basically that's exactly what it is that we're doing. So, uh, you know, in, in hearing the unemployment rate be about 8%, some people can't really relate to that and they do reverse math. And they think that that means that 92% of this country is employed. <clears throat> Here's the real number. Ask yourself this question. What percent of, the, of people that are over age 16 are actually employed? And if you, if you answered 58.5%, that is the real answer. Uh, so when we hear an unemployment rate of 8%, it, it's actually far higher than that. It doesn't take into account the fact that a lot of people have stopped looking for jobs uh, or don't care to find a job anymore. You know, some of the experts say it's about three and a half times that. What it is, I don't know, nor does it matter. Ask people around you what state the economy is in and, and you'll hear exactly what they say. In terms of the amount of money of our debt that is held by foreign nations, it's a pretty interesting uh, concept. In 1970, 5% of the American debt, which was $284 billion is what we owed in 1970, 5% of it was held by foreign nations. By 1990, 19% uh, of that debt was held by foreign nations and we had ratcheted it up to $2.4 trillion. Today in 2012, <coughs> where our national debt is $15 trillion. 47% of our national debt is held by foreign, foreign nations. And uh, when George W. Bush first took office in 2001, uh, he, our national debt was $5 trillion. By the time he left, eight years later, our national debt was $9 trillion. Significant. He spent half a trillion dollars a year. In fact, it was so much that when President Obama was on the campaign trail in North Dakota in 2007, in a speech, he called George W. Bush treasonous for spending half a trillion dollars a year. <clears throat> in the last three years, President Obama has spent six trillion dollars, quadruple the rate of what George W. Bush spent. That's two trillion dollars a year. So it's, it's unfathomable. So, and the other thing is that he spent money on all the wrong things. Turtle tunnels, yeah. skateboard parks, uh, and now we don't have enough money for our military. For, the, for those of you that, that heard him on the hot mic, when he was speaking to President Medvedev of Russia just a few weeks ago, I think he really got a keen insight in, into what Obama's real plan was for the future, where he said that when it comes to disarming the United States, he'd have more flexibility after November. That's something that affects everybody, whether you're a conservative or, wh or whether you're a liberal. Unilateral disarmament is something that just doesn't make sense for us, and it's not something that's a money-saving tool. The best way to save money on foreign wars is to avoid getting into one. <coughs> Peace through strength was, was one of Ronald Reagan's ideals, and uh, we want to we have an army and a military that's strong enough that 
no other country would want to test the, the might and the strength of the United States of America. Right now, they're testing us all the time. We see everything that's happened in foreign countries where they're really kind of pushing our buttons, so to speak, to see what the limits are of what they could do in terms of, of uh, growing, testing, building nuclear weapons, missiles, strategic nukes. For those of you that don't know, there's a difference between tactical and strategic nukes. There are nukes that they want to be able to travel to, to lands far away, totally unnecessary. And uh, basically, you know, by, by waiting until after November, I think it might just be too late for our country. And uh, I, I feel that he's not only disowned the priorities of the United States of America, but he's also disowned our, our closest ally in the Middle East, which is Israel. They're the only democracy in the Middle East. It's, it, you know, it's the home of, of both the, the Jewish and Christian faiths, and uh, they've been held out to, to dry. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you watch the news, you see what's happening, and it, it's really, truly a shame. And uh, before I go on, I am going to be, be introducing somebody to you that uh, is going to be speaking on that behalf. Uh, many of you know who Stan Tate is, Stanley Tate. Uh, he's the one who started the Florida prepaid college plan. He worked under two presidents in the White House. He is not with us this evening due to a previous commitment. However, uh, he has asked me to have somebody speak on behalf of a, uh, a social advocacy group called Real Peace in the Middle East, just for about two, two or three minutes. And uh, with no further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Mel Gobert, please come to the stage and, and speak on behalf of, of Stan Tate, and then we'll go on.